Hello? Hey, it's Brad. Brad, what's up? Nothing much. You ready to talk about 12 Monkeys? I am ready. <laughs> it was released in 1995, and it starred uh, Brad Pitt, uh, Madeline Stowe, and Bruce Willis. Can you think of any other good people? No, I can't. Those are main. Those I are the main. I... The main characters, though. Uh, yeah, those are the main ones. That's Christopher cool. Plummer is in it, but he's not really a main character. It did get 88% rot tomato from critics and from users. It got 88%. I read some of the reviews, and for the most part, uh, the reviews were. I think the reviews were pretty good as far as saying the movie was kind of. You know, maybe the plot was jumbled a little bit, or maybe a little uh, out of sorts, but the performances were good. Did you actually get a chance to watch La Jati? You know, I looked for a, a version with English subtitles, and I couldn't find one, so no, I didn't. I didn't. They have an English version uh, on uh, Hulu Plus. Um, okay, I'll yeah. check it out. Yeah, I have never been able to sit through the whole thing until <laughs> like two weeks ago when I knew we have to. We were going to talk about this. Uh, you know, it's pretty cool, I guess. You know, I mean, <laughs> I mean, one big difference between that one and this movie, they actually pass through time through injections. Um, they actually inject the uh, volunteers, as they've been called in 12 Monkeys, uh, to go into the history, into history for information. And and the actual the relationship he forms with the girl in the short movie in the uh, French version uh, is more romantic, you know, it's much more of like, uh, the flaneur, you know, the person walking the streets of Paris, uh, pre-apocalypse, um, and is, it's, you know, 12 Monkeys, there's such a strain on not succumbing to the pleasures of the past, whereas in the short film, you know, it's much more about this kind of leisurely in and out time travel. It's very interesting. That's a good point, because I did notice that any time that they were either in 1990 or in 1996, that whatever locations they used uh to film always very dingy bad side of town very run down so yeah that's it's it's a good point that they didn't bring out all the good things of the past in la jati they actually it's a nice juxtaposition where you're seeing past paris is beautiful and, and romantic and then uh real time or the time of the story is uh kind of horrid but I, you know, I was like thinking about this because when I watch movies from the '90s, mid to beginning '90s, the crime thing is always seems to be super played up. And you know, the first landing for our, you know, for Bruce Willis's character in this film uh, is April 1990, and uh, I wanted to think, well, what was going on with the with the writers? And I reviewed the Bureau of Justice Statistics, which is uh, published by the DOJ. And uh, it seems like violent crime had actually peaked in the United States around 1993, 1994, which is when they were writing this and in pre-production. So I wonder if that has an influence on the way they thought about the world for 12 Monkeys. I mean, crime itself wasn't necessarily, uh, didn't have a whole whole lot to do. I mean, there was a few shots here and there, but I think maybe just sort of the griminess of yeah. of, of everything in the past. Uh, leads you to believe that maybe a city like Baltimore, although I think Baltimore in those days was kind of a rough town. Yeah. In in uh, the early to mid '90s until they. Well, the, yeah, the crime looks bad. I mean, the crime does look bad uh, when you look at the data. But to me, when I watch a '90s film, it becomes like this cliche, you know, insane asylum and the uh, you know crime and all the things that they kind of overplay. It seems like in in those movies from that time. That I think way. I think insane asylums as a general rule, I think is overplayed. Yeah. Uh, anytime it's in a movie, I think you know it's it's funny because I was thinking about this this morning actually was I think you know ninety eight and ninety nine percent of the public's perception of an insane asylum is probably is probably that whatever depicted in that movie and yeah. any other movie yet. and it's probably way 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 different than what it is in, in reality. People yeah. running around in robes and stuff. It's just, <laughs> it just seems like every movie is the same thing. Like everybody's totally and completely nuts and just over-medicated. It's really... <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's all, it's comical. It's to the point where it's kind of comical now. It's, yeah, but that's because we've watched so many movies, you know, and you just see it over and over and over again. The actual rooms that they're sleeping in at the insane Asylum in the 1990 uh, extreme Greek uh ornamentation you know the greek um patterns all over the walls and kind of had a very strict uh geometric plan for the rooms especially the rooms that they slept in 
And it kind of reminded me of uh, Claude Nicholas Ledoux's, uh, he had a design paradigm for the perfect city in the late, I think it was late 1700s, which really led to modernist thinking throughout the 19th century. But he actually had designed insane asylums and prisons, which were kind of an early, an early form of that. And he used almost the exact same kind of pattern um, in his uh, preparation. He wanted to have a guard at the middle of a room and he wanted all the um, the institutionalized individuals in a circle so that the guard could watch them at all times. And when they actually tried this, supposedly, you know, the actual members of the institution, the ones that were being restrained, like even were more violent and acted out even worse because they felt like they were being watched all the time and didn't feel like they had any uh, solace to themselves. So it really does help you feel like he's always under some kind of psychological uh, control in the film. I was going to say that, that, that the whole, the, the time travel notion, the fact that the past can't be changed no matter what, yeah. no matter what he does, whatever happens has already happened. He's just trying to get something that will help them out in the present. That's kind of an interesting uh, way to look at time travel. Yeah. It was just sort of touched upon a couple times here and there. I mean, Bruce Willis mentioned it a couple times that he can't really do anything to change the past, and that's not really what he's, what yeah, his I like purpose that too. is. Yeah. But that's kind of a really interesting point, and that just sort of gets lost in the distraction of, you know, the army of the 12 monkeys and Brad Pitt's character, which I think, I don't know if that was the point, but yeah, but it maybe would have been too confusing to sort of continue to hit upon that issue, and maybe Bruce Willis, is, his character is not sophisticated enough to get into a discussion on that on that issue, so maybe that's, it was left alone, but that notion I think is interesting, but they really didn't expand on that at all yeah i did enjoy you know another thing that's not talked about or you don't hear a lot about but in the 90s this whole you know madeline stowe's character i forgot her name in the in the movie but she says you know psychology is the new religion etc and you know and in architectural theory that is that was something that was hammered in the 90s uh, a lot of there's this uh, a whole idea of phenomenology and uh, there's a whole kind of wing of architectural theory contemporary architecture theory that you know is really trying to deal with psychology as a um, foundation for a new way to build spaces and then there's a whole other critical wing that says it's complete bogus crap and uh, you know we should move back to building spaces that people need to use so more realistic and i just thought it was interesting that you know this is a movie that deals a lot with uh, i don't know has architecture as a foundation even if it's not explicit, uh, and did deal with that as well, talking about psychology as this new, uh, this new religion, this new way of reframing the entire world, uh, and maybe it doesn't work as, <laughs> as, as planned, you know, because you know, in the what was it, the eighties, seventy eighties, economic, you know, you, they used uh, uh, economic supply demand curves for everything, you know, everything in the world had to fit into right. an economic system. And then, and then after that kind of, uh, superseding that became the psychological, uh, psychology, uh, the psychology, uh, template that everybody pressed upon every, every issue or, or concern. And, and, and then I think this movie was nice in saying, well, maybe it's bogus as well. And we got to move on, you know? Oh, one thing I thought was fun is that Christopher Maloney, uh, Maloney, Christopher Maloney was in this movie as a detective. Do you know who? Yeah, he is? the uh, Law and Order guy. Yeah, Special Victims Unit, I think. Yeah, I looked it up, and uh, you know he plays uh, Lieutenant Halperin. You know, I do not even remember him being in that movie until we re- I rewatched it. I mean, he was like nobody. Well, I didn't know him at all. And then after this, he did uh, NYPD. He did Homicide, and he did three separate syndicates of Law and Order. I mean, the guy made a career of this uh, detective work afterwards. Being a police officer, detective. I read that uh, Terry Gilliam gave gave Bruce Willis quotes, movie cliches, not to say that he can't say those cliches in the movie, and he can't uh, he could he couldn't give the the, the padded Bruce Willis steely blue eyed uh, stare. You know when he squints his eyes, he he said that he, you can't do that in this movie. And what he, else? He <laughs> gave him lines. He gave him lines that he couldn't say. And he gave him a look. He said, "You cannot, you cannot do that." So I'm sure that there were a lot of quotes, go-to yeah. quotes that he had. And he said, "You can't, you can't use any of any of these quotes at all." I mean, is <laughs> Which it? I thought was funny. <clears throat> but you can see, like, I, I was watching the movie, and yeah. there's probably aren't a lot of places where you could. There aren't a lot of places where you could throw in a one-liner, but there's definitely 
there's definitely room for him to throw, you know, the cheesy action movie one liner. Yeah. And and I think I read a lot of reviews also that said this was, you know, Bruce Willis's best performance, which I'm not sure about, but it may be the only one where it was he didn't play an action hero or an action character or a strong character. He just played a dude that was trying to get a job done and was struggling and needed a lot of help. And because I remember just the visual impact of the movie was enough to keep me interested to see the cities falling apart and the animals taking over and the monkeys and the red uh, graffiti. You know, this is like, it's almost like a Banksy art piece. The, uh, the actual monkeys on the clock and the accordion playing. I just remember being in, in a total uh, milieu or environment that it sucked me in when I watched the film over and over again on my laserdisc player. I loved it. Yeah, I probably, that's probably why I liked it when I first saw it a long time ago. That, but, but now when you look at it, it doesn't quite hold up. Maybe production-wise, maybe visually, it doesn't quite hold up. But I found that the story just didn't, it didn't, uh, wasn't that interesting, wasn't that compelling. I mean, Brad Pitt was very good, but even he was a little over the top, but he was very good. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So otherwise, you know, it didn't have a whole lot that I could, you know, I could say I mean, something th- you need to see. That's something I really liked about it is that all three of the primary actors, uh, you know, Madeline Stowe, Brad Pitt, and Bruce Willis took it extremely seriously. I mean, I think, and they did a great job playing the characters as they've been handed. You know, I thought they, they didn't overact, but they seemed to, they played it straight. I mean, really well. I mean, they did a good job, I felt like. He did a great job. Madeline Stowe yeah. was very good. Bruce Willis was good. So the main characters are right. The main characters were, were really good, but... I, you know, sometimes I wish that in like the Twelve Monkeys group, I wish Terry Gillum had actually reflected on like the Weather Underground and real American groups uh, that are less reported. Because uh, um, you know, I, I mean, I don't know if he was or not, but I don't. It doesn't look familiar. It just looks like kind of the um, one-dimensional terrorist group, not like uh, the ones that actually existed at least in the '70s and somewhat in the '90s with the like the uh, World Trade Organization riots in Seattle. Was that? There have been groups in history, and it would be interesting to have some historic perspective on those uh, through film. Another thing, I remember my brother and I screaming, you know, buy, sell, trade, you know, all the time when we felt felt (laughs) over-consumerized, you know, like when we were at Walmart or, uh, you know, Sam's Club with my mom, and we were so sick of it. We would just start screaming at her in the Brad Pitt voice, you know. It was something we kind of really believed in. it kind of got it influenced us now and i'm sure that was kind of a foundational thing but now when you look at it you don't even remember that being a big deal but it kind of was a big deal the florida keys commercial that runs over and over throughout the whole film i know it's helping you line up the uh line up the kind of narrative but it's also reminding you that the 90s were kind of this you know consumerist you know uh peak in some way with the we had the uh, Berlin Wall had fallen and, and and globalization had really taken off. If if you remember, I mean, it's it's pretty interesting. Plus, in 1990, when he was uh, when he came back the first time, I believe, I believe that Miami Vice was, I think it was a top top ten show at the time on TV. And ah. So uh, I mean, Miami itself, it was a real boon in for Miami itself. People, yeah. Uh, coming to Florida anyway because of that. So I'm not really surprised that the Florida Keys or Florida in general yeah. was um it was, was mentioned so much. Yeah. As much as it was. Yeah, yeah my advice might be Golden a... Girls I think was popular. You yeah. know, Golden Girls in those days I think was popular and they were set in Florida. Yeah, we we got it. We might have to do in season 2, we might have to do a, a Miami Vice review. And yeah. in fact, Last year, I watched. I went back and I watched every uh, every episode of Miami Vice. Oh, you did back and back again to watch them all. I did, yeah. Oh man, yeah. We definitely have to put that on uh, next season. Put that on the list. Oh, there were. Oh, so did you ever get to read the uh, district uh, U.S. District Court opinion, Woods v. Universal City Studios? No, I didn't read the opinion, but I. I but I did read that uh, eventually that they settled for. They paid him a lot of money. Uh, yeah, high six figures in order to use to use the set and um, and I think on on your notes you said that he got a film credit. A little background is Woods um, is an architect and his buddy called him up and said, "Have you seen this uh, movie Twelve Monkeys? If you haven't, come see it right now." They went and saw it, 
and lo and behold, a movie had been made and they had, uh, you know, done a complete carbon copy of one of his or most commercially successful drawings that he has in his books. And um, right there on this film, they had basically copied it piece by piece and, and used it uh, in the film. It's the interrogation room where they have the the orb that is kind of looking back at, at Bruce Willis as he's being asked questions by the scientist and, and restrained. So they, they, the, the scene where he's sitting in that metal chair and yeah. he's uh, restrained. It's oh. three, it's three scenes in the movie and they kind of like question him and there's, and it's almost, I have the book here. If you want to look at it next time you're at the house, uh, it's just almost exact copy. Even, even the way the metal panels are, uh, affixed to the wall behind him in a kind of a four by eight grid, the, uh, the same in the movie and in the book, uh, in, in, Woods is, uh, I mean, I loved the uh, actual work being expressed in, in in full scale in the movie. I mean, you really get to kind of a simulation of what his work would look like if humans were in it. Yeah, so even no matter how bad this movie might be, then yeah. uh, you're always going to have something positive to say. Let's go. I'll start by saying uh, for the Riazi star system, I actually, for the cinematic rating, I would give it a one star. Um of the movies that Terry Gillum has made, this is one of the most watchable ones for for a typical person or for someone that isn't a huge uh, cinephile. I, I think. Um, I think I would give it zero, only because the performances are really good, but not enough for me at least. Because I think you can see those actors doing better in different things, and I think the story itself is not compelling enough. There's a lot, I mean, there's a lot of interesting points, but I don't think any of them were developed, and I think some of them fell flat for me. So I would say uh, zero. I think you can see Willis and Pitt and Stowe and a bunch of other different things that are that are much better. Okay, cool. So zero stars for the cinematic. What do you think about the architectural? What's your architectural rating from uh, from your perspective? Um, I would say zero too because I, there just there wasn't much in it other than a lot of the old buildings yeah. uh, at the beginning of the movie in the snow and then towards the end when he was seeing himself or realizing that these are the same buildings he saw when he was uh, above ground. But um, I mean everything was really dingy. So the the present well I shouldn't say the present the 1990 and 96 parts of the movie are all sort of in bad parts of town. So yeah. there's not much to look at and underground. I, I guess maybe the underground portions could have been a little more fully developed so we could really see what, what life is like so you could have a little more emotional, emotional investment in what Bruce Willis was trying to do. But it wasn't. So I, I don't know. There, just, there wasn't a whole lot of... But, I, but all in all, I would say zero for architecture myself. The, the one major thing that's so awesome about this movie is you actually get to see Wood's work, even if it's simulated in cinema, you actually get to see it for once and uh, it's a human scale with humans working with it. And that's such a rarity. He already died. He died in the um... hurricane Sandy. Yeah. He died during the Sandy hurricane Sandy. And so he only really had one or he had one major project that was built in, in, um, in China. And then he has a couple of artsy projects in Europe. But for those hardcore fans of his work, like myself, uh, a lot of the best work is like the work that was shown in this movie. The The interrogation room is a real famous one. It, it was supposed to express this otherness, this like place for new technology. And he was always questioning whether the technology is going to kind of look back at you or you're going to look at it or how the relationships are going to change over time. And, and even though 12 Monkeys is a real negative, um, you know, expression of that, it's still builds this kind of dialogue of what are, where does technology take us and what is it doing to us in, in general? It's a unique opportunity uh, that you don't get in very many movies. Long story short, this is one of the only opportunities you get to see Woods' actual work in a 3D sense. I give it two stars just for that. They stole the material. They did a good job stealing it, so it looks good, and it looks like you'd expect it to be. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> You know, I think that's awesome. I mean, and yeah, he got paid uh, in the end, but I mean, it's it's just so fitting because Woods was is always questioned the political power of architecture, like and and he's a big critic of globalization as just the de facto way things are going to be. He feels that we should be much more careful and questioning, 
I don't know. That's that, that makes me feel better, or not feel better, but I, it makes me want to promote it more as something you should see before uh, before you put it away. Yeah, I would agree with that. 